Hi, we're speaking to Dr. Nengo now about his recent work on a fossil ape skull. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Could you please give us a summary of the paper? Right, in, in the paper we do an initial description of uh, the new infant cranium from Kenya. And uh, so what, uh, what we have, the main findings are that um, it belonged to an infant uh, aged about one year and uh, four months. And um, we also, uh, we know it uh, from a fossil site that is dated at about 13 million years ago. Um, it, the uh, fossil was preserved in uh, a series of uh, volcanic ashes, specimen about 13 million years ago. Uh, the other major finding is that um, it belongs to a group of um, now extinct apes that uh, we call the Nyanzapetesins which previously had only been known from uh, fragments of uh, mandible, mandibles and teeth. So with this, um, and, and so because of that, it had been very difficult to locate them um, as far as their relationship was concerned with um, the living and the other extinct apes that we know. So uh, what this specimen allows us to do is to show that um, the specimen, the, the group they called the Nyanzapetesins, uh probably the most closest uh, ancestors in the fossil record of um, humans and ape lineage uh, combined and that uh, that lineage evolved in uh, in africa okay and as you said um, it was found it was to do with the volcanic ash and um, could you tell me a little bit more about the preservation um, process and why was it so brilliantly preserved Right, so um, usually fossils get preserved uh, when they get trapped in the bottom of lakes or uh, they get trapped in the banks of, uh, of rivers. And uh, those are conditions that, uh, you know, uh, things are exposed uh, for a long time on the surface and, uh, you know, bacteria and other uh, processes then will cause the disintegration of the material before it uh, preserves. But um, another way that uh, fossils get um, uh, uh, preserved is when you have these uh, volcanic eruptions that throw out this massive uh, layers of ash that instantly will bury whatever is on the landscape. And this is one of those cases where that's how the fossil, uh, the site was, uh, was formed. You know, so around 13 million years ago, there was a huge volcanic eruption in this area in the Turkana Basin, we call Napodet. And uh, the volcano put out, um, you know, up to 20, uh, 50 meters of ash, burying a whole forest. And uh, uh, amongst the things that were buried in this fossil, uh, in this forest was uh, this uh, infant. And um, volcanic ashes contain um, a material that is very much like cement and when it percolates, when it, if it's wet and it percolates into the bones, it preserves them really, really well. So this um, skull is really important because the cranium is so complete. Um, why else is it important? What else does it tell us about ape evolution in particular? Right, so you know, um, when we look at um, living uh, things that we're most close related to, uh, we know that uh, the apes are our closest relatives and that um, now we, the, amongst the living apes, you have the gibbons and the orangutans, which are found in Asia. And then you have the gorillas and chimpanzees, which are found in Africa. And we've all, we, we want to know um, where does the common ancestor of all those things, the two from Asia, and the two from Africa, and then human beings, which we know are also from Africa. Where did that common ancestor of that whole group come from? And um, why is that important? Because then if we know where they come from, we know the environmental conditions, then we can begin to understand uh, some of the factors that would have caused uh, the divergence and uh, the groups to evolve to eventually look like the way they did and uh, so because uh, the two of those living species are in Africa and two of those living species are in Asia 
And there are lots of uh, ape fossils that have been found in Asia, lots of ape fossils in Africa. It's been difficult to figure out where exactly did the common ancestors of all those living apes and humans come from. And so with this fossil, uh, for the first time, we're able to show that um, that ancestor probably lived in, in, in Africa. So that's one thing. Then the other thing is that um, the other important contribution is that uh, we'd like to know what that ancestor looked like. At every stage of evolution, we'd like to know what did our ancestors look like? Because when we know what they look like, then we can, we can begin to explain how they came to be. And so when we look in the fossil record, uh, the things that we came from, things that are most closely related to us, when we push into the fossil record, we find a, a, a fairly good fossil record uh, starting from now, pushing back into a million years ago, two million years ago, where you find Homo erectus uh, fossils, and we have really nice skeletons and skulls of Homo erectus. Uh, we push back into three and a half million years ago, where we find Lucy. We have a full, uh, almost, uh, I mean, a good, not a full skeleton, but a good chunk of a skeleton, and we have good faces as, as well. Uh, we push back to four million years, we have Adipithecus, and um, we push back to seven million years ago, we have a, a species called Cyanathropus chadensis that was found in Africa as well, with an almost complete skull there. And then as we now push back deeper into past seven million years, the uh, trail begins to dry up. We don't find faces. Uh, what we mostly find are jaws and teeth. So, you know, post seven million, eight, nine, ten, there's nothing. And then, um, so boom, we'll get to 13 now, and we find a lessee. So um, if we go back in time at 13 million years, and we were looking for something that was in our lineage, that was closest to us in the fossil record, that would give us some sense about what our ancestors looked like 13 million years ago. This is the only thing that we have. It is a brilliant specimen and when you look at the orbits, I mean, it's so easy to imagine what, what it must have looked like. Um, what I was wondering is you mentioned about the teeth, so normally teeth survive really well in the fossil record and this specimen has got a lot of teeth. And um, What did that tell us about their diet and behaviour? Right, so um, the, the, the specimen being, um, being a, a juvenile or being a, a, a young one, has two sets of teeth. There's the milk teeth that had erupted. And um, if you turn it around, you'll see that those are, those are gone. Those, got, those, uh, those broke off and got lost before we found it. But likely because it's a, it's a, it's a juvenile, it's so young, the unerupted uh, teeth are all in the skull. And when we took it to the synchrotron in Grenoble, where we, um, we have in the whole world, some of the purest and most powerful x-rays that we can generate that would allow us to peer through, you know, the hardest material, the most difficult material, you can peer through it and not only peer through it, but also and really look at things inside in really, really fine uh, resolution. So uh, we spent 10 days at Grenoble, we scanned this thing. Normally, when a fossil is so well preserved, uh, it just becomes solid rock, and when you try to scan it, you don't see anything. The, the unusual thing about this fossil is that when we scanned it, the, the, all the structures inside are beautifully preserved, including all the teeth. And uh, so there are two things we learned from the teeth right now that are important. Uh, as far as the diet is concerned, we can see that um, the incisors uh, are shaped like the incisors of uh, primates that typically eat fruit. You know, when, when a primate eats uh, fruit, it has uh, the front incisors uh, are very strongly built. And also the same thing with the molars, they are designed, the cusps of the molars are designed to crush fruit. So we don't know for sure, but uh, from what we have, uh, we suspect that they live on a diet of, um, of, uh, of fruit. 
and probably supplemented with, uh, with leaves because fruit does not have proteins. And typically when primates eat fruit, they supplement their diet with either proteins or with either, for proteins with either leaves or with insects. In this case, we think that they probably ate um, fruit and, and, um, and some leaves. And then the other thing we learn is, um, is the age. Now, and the only place you could do this is, um, is um, the synchrotron allows you to do is to look at things at the sub-micron level, look at structures at the sub-micron level. A micron is one thousandth of a millimeter. So you, can, you can imagine how tiny you think you can look at them, but you can, you know, you can blow them up and look at them as if they're, you know, they're, you're looking at them just with your naked eyes. And what that allows us to do is to count the growth rate when the when the enamel grows. It uh, the layers of there are layers of growth that are, are laid out the same way you see the growth rings in a tree. But the growth rings in a tree are annual. In this case, they are daily. So we can count the daily growth um, rings up until the day that Leslie died. And that allows us to estimate the age quite um, reason, reason to a high degree of precision. So we know that it was about, about 480 something days, plus or minus 30 days. So um, the, that's unprecedented. It's the first time in the fossil record that we have something that we can get a date, uh, calendar date so precisely. And that will allow us to um, you know, look at, um, uh, you know, answer questions about how do these things grow? You know, by the age grew, by the, by the age when it died, how big was its brain? Uh, you know, is it growing on a trajectory that's similar to monkeys or, or, or apes? Uh, we can, uh, the other thing that happens is that when, when the teeth grow and you have these rings, um, these rings are laid down, the, if there's a stress, if there's any uh, significant stress, it, it stops. It stops for a day or two or three. And so you can see the stress line when the baby was born. There's uh, a stress line when the baby was, was weaned. So we can, we, can, we can tell when the teeth started growing. We can tell when the baby was born. We can tell how many days it was when the baby was weaned. We have a couple of other stress lines that uh, may have been associated with other events in the environment that we cannot interpret. So we have uh, we have a, a, a story of growth that we can tell and we can compare with other uh, living apes and humans, and um, you know try to figure out when human uniquely human patterns, for example, would have uh, would have evolved. So that's something that is uh, also unprecedented that we are learning from uh, from the teeth. Wow, that, that is fascinating and it's amazing how precise it can be um, and almost that it's, so it's going to sound horrible, but it was almost like a benefit that a juvenile was found because you've got both sets of dentition and you can see the growth in that way. Um, so I was just wondering what's next for this research? Right, so um, if, as we speak actually today, what we're doing is um, I'm in the process of putting together a grant proposal that uh, we're just about to submit by the end of this week. Actually, we've been working on this for a while. And what we've done is that we've looked around and found uh, the, all the different specialists that work on the skull. You know, it, it's, a, you, it's difficult to imagine how much time and effort it takes to learn just how the teeth grow or just how the sinuses are put together or the internal structures are put together. So each of these different aspects of the morphology requires a, special, a, a specialist. So there are people who spend their lifetime just looking at specific areas of uh, the anatomy of the skull. So what we've done is we've assembled a team of 16 specialists in various uh, areas of the skull. Um, we have uh, a specialist who's a neuroanatomist. He, he, he works on the folds on the, of the brain. Um, we have a specialist on the, the other thing that is nicely preserved is the body of brain that is involved with, um, with balance and, uh, and hearing. 
We have the middle ear apparatus that is also involved in, in the ear. There's a tiny little bones called malus incus and stapes that is also preserved. So we have a specialist who's going to walk and look at that. Um, we have, um, uh, I already mentioned uh, uh, the sinuses. You know, so, uh, and then we have uh, somebody who is uh, a specialist on, on all the fossil apes that have been found in Europe and Africa. In, he he uh, knows all this this different um, different and all these different apes intimately well, and so we're bringing all these people. And each of them has their team, total of sixteen people, folks. So we're going to come together in a, a few weeks, and we're going to have um, we're going to have a workshop um, because um, we one of the challenges there two uh, the two important challenges that we have here. Uh, you know, beautiful challenges though. One of them is that um, is that the way we learn about um, about how things evolve is by comparing, by comparing different things. But here we have an infant. It's the only infant, so there's nothing in the fossil record to compare it with. And so we have to figure out a way um, how we're going to. Um, whatever is available or adults, how do you take an infant and, and be able to compare it with the downs when we know that when an infant grows, it changes. So we're gonna learn a whole range of things about development, what changes, what doesn't change, which characters remain stable, which characters don't change, uh, uh, change by looking at chimpanzees, gorillas, growth in humans, you know, and work out a development series in each of these different uh, different groups, and all those different aspects of morphology that we talked about, and then um, uh, you know, and then we can see which are stable that can be used to do the comparisons, but also uh, if once we know what is stable and what is not stable, uh, one of the specialists <coughs> is a, is um, is a, from the Max Planck Institute, and this is what he does. That he will grow a lessy, so we can see what a lessy will look like when it's uh, it's an adult. You know, so we have a, a uh, and then the second set of problem that we we are um, we are uh, looking at is that if you have all these different aspects of morphology, and how do you in integrate them and do an analysis of, uh, to compare, you know, to figure out the relationship living and extinct things because usually you only have one aspect of morphology and another aspect of the morphology you never have the middle ear and the sinus and the brain and all that stuff together so how do we combine all of that to get a whole picture of of, um, of uh, a phylogenetic relationship so the workshop will figure that out and then we'll when we split each group will then tackle the problems at some point we're going to come back and um and um, combine it all so you should expect to see a series of um of path breaking uh, announcement papers that are going to come out over the next 10 years on um, on the analysis and then the second thing we're doing is that uh, we're going back to the field i'll be back in the field in january at napodec we found a partial skeleton uh, not at the same place, but pretty close to where we found a lessy. It was the end of the fall season. We couldn't do anything but build embankments to preserve the site. So we're going to go back there and um, and start doing some excavations and also looking for new sites as well. Wow, that is so exciting. Wow, that is so exciting. I'm really looking forward to, really looking forward um, to all about this, all about this and seeing the publications. <laughs> Yes. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, we'll put a link to the paper below and also the press release. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me.